This show shares compelling stories and experiences of well-known faces and everyday people who change the world in big and small ways. Get ready to open your mind and your heart with Melissa Billy Clark. Hi, thank you so much for joining us here on Making a Difference. I'm Melissa Billy Clark. I am so excited to have this wonderful man with us today, Mr. Michael Kutcher. He is such an inspiration. We're going to go through his life story. Michael Kutcher is a working professional living with cerebral palsy. Uh, he has been through his fair share of scares at the age of 13. He was diagnosed with viral cardiomyopathy, which I have a hard time saying. It is a condition where the heart muscles weaken. His heart grew four times the normal size, and he was told he had three to four weeks to live. Shortly after that, he went into cardiac arrest and was given 48 hours. And then a donor came in and saved his life. He is a motivational speaker with a can-do attitude and for people who have cerebral palsy, an advocate for organ donation as well. Watch Michael in action. People also ask me, you know, Michael, how do you get so slim? How do you look so good? Keep that figure looking good. Well, he's been eating my food ever since I was in the womb. <laughs> I mean, that's Jabba Hutt if I ever saw it. That's a big baby. Uh, hi, Melissa. Thank you for, uh, for allowing me to, to be on your show today. Thank you, Michael, so much. Michael, uh, the clip that we just saw, what I love about your lectures is that you are very entertaining uh, while speaking and being uh, entertaining runs in your family. Your fraternal twin brother is Ashton Kutcher. Um, tell us about growing up and the support that you had in your family with everything that you went through, please. I mean, growing up, we, you know, born and raised in uh, Cedar Rapids, Iowa, mm -hmm. in a normal uh, middle class family. Uh, my parents, you know, worked hard all their lives to, to provide for their family. And it was, it was myself, uh, my twin brother, of course, and, uh, and our older sister. Um, yeah. And it was your typical family. Um, what, was, what was great about the family that I had was... Uh, the sense of inclusion. Mm -hmm. um, even though I did have a disability, no one really spoke about it. No one, um, I, I would say no one acknowledged it to the point where Michael was different. Mm -hmm. um, I was, you know, I would do the same things that my brother would do. I would do the same things my sister would do. Um, I may just have to, to do them a little bit differently, or I might have to try harder um, to be able to get over you know, the, the, um, the setbacks or the difficulties that I had with, with my disability. Mm -hmm. um, so I, my family were just very loving and, and inclusive. Um, and those are the memories that I have uh, about my family. Tell us what cerebral palsy is, please. You know, cerebral palsy is uh, one of the, the number one uh, motor disabilities um, and it affects uh, about 17 million people worldwide. Mm -hmm. uh, one in about 325, you know, uh, children are affected with it. It's a little bit difficult to diagnose. Uh, it's often misdiagnosed as well. So the numbers are, are skewed a little bit. But what it is, is it is a, uh, a disability that affects, you know, the brain mm -hmm. and it's, uh, even though there's there's really no known cause of it, mm -hmm. um, it's it's thought to be caused by some tra some trauma, uh, especially during birth, right. uh, to the brain. And uh, how it affects people is you, there's various types or severities mm -hmm. of disability of cerebral palsy, and um, it can affect people severely to where they have speech issues, uh, they can't speak, uh, maybe they have trouble eating, uh, maybe they are, they're, you know, utilizing um, mobility devices or uh, wheelchairs. So the severity is all over the, the spectrum. Right. Um, and, and myself, I have a very mild form 
of cerebral palsy, uh, which affects my speech, my eyesight, uh, I'm, I'm, you know, my hearing, so I'm deaf in one ear, mm-hmm. um, and also it affects um, my right side. Mm-hmm. So I have less mo- less movement um, on my right on the right side of my body. Mm-hmm. Wow! Well, well, you're you're able to have a wonderful life. You have a wife and child. You're a vice assistant vice president mm-hmm. to Trans America. Yep. So I'm uh, I've been with uh, the organization about 16 years, mm-hmm. um, and and started my career there in, in finance. And um, so I'm the assistant vice president, uh, uh, Transamerica Retirement Solutions. Mm-hmm. Uh, I say it's a kind of a glorified title for just uh, someone who's selling pension plans. Um, but you know, I really enjoy my my day job and um, you know, um, being productive. Uh, and and you know, I'm fortunate to where you know cerebral palsy. Uh, is less severe in my case, mm-hmm. and I do have the ability to to live predominantly a, 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 a quote unquote normal productive life. Um, mm-hmm. I have a beautiful family, wife, uh, my son, and then um, I've got two ch- two step children as well. Oh, God bless. And what got me impressed was your series, all the series that you took. So you have your series six. 63, you were saying? I mean, these are tough um, tests to take. Yeah, uh, you know, financial industry requires a lot. So I've got uh, a number of financial licenses, um, you know, and it, it was, uh, I'm thankful that I started studying for those right out of college. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, I was kept in that that uh, mode of, uh, of learning and, and um Wonderful, wonderful. You're a total inspiration. Uh, let's let's go back to CP and um, funding. You know, uh, mm-hmm. you w- went to Washington. Uh, tell us about the time when you went to Washington and, and what did you try to accomplish there? So I've been to Washington a number of times. Um, and uh, the last time I believe um, was right around uh, 2014, I believe. Mm-hmm. Uh, me a number of a number of individuals from an organization that I I uh, belong to and sit on the board with, reaching for the stars. Um, they um, we went to Washington to to ask for more funding uh, from the from the NIH and, and Congress uh, for cerebral palsy because at the time. Um, as you may may or may not know, uh, when they when they write budgets every year, mm-hmm. uh, the NIH has um, a specific budget that they allocate to um, various disabilities, uh, various organizations, maybe, and um, various causes. Right. Uh, for instance, uh, autism maybe have a, a budget a line item for that for their cause. Um, Cystic fibrosis might have a, a line I am for their cause. <clears throat> but as we got researching and, and looking at the various allocation of budgets, we realized that cerebral palsy is not even on the budget. Like we literally had no line item on the budget. Uh, so, you know, during our second uh, trip to DC, we, we met with the NIH uh, and we were able to secure you know, at least um, that line item um, and for the projected research and, and budgeting uh, for cerebral palsy. Now, now there's more work to be done. Uh, mm-hmm. There's obviously more uh, budget to, to fight for, um, but without money uh, in the budget, it's hard to do the research and, um, and provide the, the funding for the research, you know, to to find causes, to find treatments, to um, you know, maybe find a cure someday of how, sure. how can we better prevent this. Uh, what's interesting is when I grew, when I was diagnosed with, at three years old with cerebral palsy, right. my, mother, my mother had no resources available to her at all. 
We did all of the treatment, all the therapies, uh, for the most part at home. And she was tasked with doing that as a, as a parent. Um, and what's interesting is we jump forward to where we are today. Mm-hmm. Yes, there, there are more, you know, resources out there, but I mean, we're talking 40 some years. Right. Right. Um, that was the early eighties. Mm. Yeah. There's early eighties and, and we should be further along than what we are today. Absolutely. And the reason we're not is funding. Why do you think there is a lack of funding regarding um, CP? I think that it's a lack of uh, visibility. Uh, I think when we went to Washington, we really put a light on the, the cerebral palsy cause. And I think that, you know, those with the louder voices mm-hmm. get heard. Um, and, you know, it's, during our first trip to, to D.C., uh, we learned really about the bureaucracy and about how, you know, it, I laugh about it today because I'm, I'm really a political guy or, or I, I get into politics. But we learned how political Washington really was. And um, I was, I guess I was very naive back then. Um, right. But it is. And it's, you know, those who have the the louder voices and those who um, have the higher statue, Mm -hmm. I guess, um, get heard. And we were, our voices weren't loud enough. Are celebrities doing a lot of, you know, are they doing any work with CP that you know of? I mean, there's, there's a a number of them uh, that are, um, they they have worked within the CP community. you know, RJ Mitty, um, he's the the um, uh, the actor on uh, Breaking Bad. Mm-hmm. Uh, I know that he's done some work with, with CP and I've had the opportunity to meet with him over the years and uh, some other uh, individuals are, are uh, assisting with the advocacy work. Um, but it's really a grassroots effort. I mean, yeah. you've got thousands and thousands of families are affected by CP across uh, across the, the U.S. at least. And, you know, one thing about disabilities, and, and I can speak more to the CP, is, mm-hmm. you know, the resources there that, that uh, it takes to, to raise a child with CP. Um, it takes over you know, a million dollars to fully raise an individual uh, uh, affected in in living with CP. Um, So, you know, when you talk about funding and you talk about getting organizations together, a a lot of these families are affected, they're already strapped for resources. Um, So it's difficult to, to get the groups together and get the funding. Uh, but I was fortunate to to have uh, joined the the Reach for the Stars organization. Mm-hmm. We've since um, kind of uh, merged with uh, the Cerebral Palsy Foundation uh, today, and uh, Cerebral Palsy Foundation has uh, amazing resources uh, on their. You can check them out on their website, um, and a lot a lot more community action um, and resources available today than there were available in the in the early 80s. Do they give out grants at all or? A cerebral palsy foundation? Yeah. Um, I think there is some some grant giving. uh, That's really not my uh, area of expertise within within the organization. Uh, Mm. But yeah, I think I think they do uh, assist as well. Sure. So anybody, please head over to, is it Reaching for the Stars? I'll put all the information up um, at the end. It's yeah, Reaching it, for the Stars? Reaching for the Stars was, was the old organization. Oh, okay. Uh, so we've since merged into uh, the Cerebral Palsy, I'm sorry. Yes, the, the Cerebral Palsy Foundation, CPF. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you can go in and Google them, visit their website as well. 
fantastic. Thank you. Um, I called up uh, cerebral palsy of Westchester here in New York City, in, here in New mm -hmm. York, and I was talking to a wonderful woman in the human resources department. I think her name was Tia. And she was telling me, I had, I had a really, I had a question. So I'm like, you know, if these people with cerebral palsy, if they're not getting state funds, do they have a copay each time they're going for their therapy session? Mm -hmm. And they have to pay a copay if they do not have um, help from the state, which I find, you know, it's crazy. So each time they're trying to, you know, uh, strengthen themselves or maintain uh, because they just, they have to pay copay. And I found that very disturbing. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that, that goes to the expense that I talked about, you yeah. know, um, if you've got, you know, what cerebral palsy does it, it tightens up your muscles. Right. So you, you constantly have to work in therapy to, to loosen up your muscles and, and uh, assist your body. And, you know, those therapies cost. Uh, there's costs associated with it. There's a lot of uh, surgeries involved right. that can be involved in, in uh, with uh, assisting someone with cerebral palsy as well. And and to my point earlier, a lot of these families don't have the the resources to to do so. I mean, there are you know Medicaid uh, funding right. can assist, in, you know if, if they. Uh, if they apply and they're approved that they can assist uh, with that as well. But um, it, it, there is a costly expense to it. Right. And not to mention the um, aides who work with these patients, they work sometimes around the clock and they're only getting minimum wage. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, this needs a lot of help. Um, and, uh, and, and I hope maybe perhaps we touched upon and, and, you know, brought awareness to this because it needs more funding. It's, it's definitely an organization that needs more funding because these people need help. They, they can contribute to society. They, they do have a voice and a life and a heartbeat. And um, I hope that that helps. <laughs> well, and, yeah, and, and also, I mean, since I've been advocating for cerebral palsy, I've really found myself um, becoming an advocate for all with disabilities and not just cerebral palsy and you know as i got more ingrained into other disabilities they're no different than what cerebral palsy is my sister works for the saint nicholas center in lake charles louisiana and and it's an autistic uh, community uh because my my nephew who's six has autism and as i i learned more and more about the autism community they're, they deal with the same things, uh, with the funding at these community centers and the, the ability to get funding for, for therapies. Um, so it's, it's a much needed um, area of our community. Uh, yes. To your point, people with disabilities, um, it, it doesn't mean that they don't have the ability to do things. It means that they may have to approach things differently and, and one of my, my key points that I like to make is if you really think about your life, we all are different. Yes. I mean, who, who really wants to be the same? Um, so we all are different. We all have what I call not disabilities, but diffabilities. Diffabilities. Right? So, diffabilities. I like that, like, Michael. Like, you know, Melissa, you may, you may be really good at something, and I'm not as good as what you are right? But I may do things really well that you can't do either. So we just have different ways that, that we focus on things and different abilities. Um, and we need to, we need to embrace that more yes. versus dividing us. Going back to what you said before with, uh, what do you call it? Diff Differabilities? Diffabilities. Diffabilities. Yeah. I like that. I saw you and I want I, I have a quote here. I saw you on Good Day Iowa. And what you said uh, to one of the anchors, it resonated with me and it actually made me feel very good. Uh, you said, and I quote, you are the only one who can overcome your challenges. And they are not challenges, they are opportunities. And if you, if you can turn those opportunities into helping other people, then everybody's better. Everyone's better. <laughs> 
And I like that very much. And I want to thank you for saying that because as we were speaking before, I have a hard time articulating what I say most of the time, right? So it's in here and I'm trying to get it out and out of the mouth. And, you know, but here I am hosting a show and I try my best and, you know, I, and I have a platform here that can help people. Um, and I'm sure people are judging me with the way I talk sometimes or my vocabulary and that's okay because as long as I get my message out, <laughs> that's all that I care about. So thank you, Michael. <laughs> yeah. I think that we, you know, more and more people that have challenges, they need to embrace how they're different. Yes. And they need, you need to be okay with that. And it took me a long time to embrace who I was yeah. and the challenges that I had and actually embrace that I had disability because I wouldn't even, I wouldn't even talk about it for, you know, until I was in my thirties right. uh, because I myself, even though having a disability, I didn't want the stigma that came with it in society. And once I did embrace it, and once mm -hmm. I did come out and tell my friends and tell my community, it, it was a weight off my shoulders and no one treated me any differently. Right. Uh, so, you know, it, it was a wake up call to me, but I think it's, it's important. You go back to my quote and I, I right. think that we, you know, we need to look for ways that we can help other people and that we can give back to the community. Yes. And, um, and once I was able to, to embrace my, my disability, I saw an opportunity for me to actually give back to others. Right. Um, and it's been one of the, the blessings of my life um, is to be able to, to give back to, um, to these various communities. And, and I often say that I think that we all have a purpose in life um you just have to find it and um you know through through my journey uh i feel that uh, this is my purpose Absolutely. and many many things have led me down this road to to my purpose such a positive way to look at you know what's happened um it, throughout your life uh before we get into your heart, uh, I'd like to talk about what happened to you when you were 13. Um, let's just touch upon really quick uh, bullying because, you know, mm -hmm. we're in our 40s. So way back when bullying was like, well, I just we turned 40. Yeah. <laughs> I kind of like it, you know, over the hill. Though. We like our 40s. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's, well, that's a lot of work now. <laughs> um, but when we were children, when we were kids, bullying was like, I mean, I got bullied. A bullying was just the thing to do. So how did you overcome that? And now it's kind of, you know, now it's just, it's kind of, uh, you know, if you're bullying, you're, you're the devil. So now it's just, you know, we're, we're in a good place now, but how did you go through your um, bullying phase? Yeah. Um, overcome is a strong word. Uh, I don't know that I really did overcome um, is maybe just accept Exactly. And I think because people are going to do what they what they feel they need to do, regardless of you, you know, you know, what you say back to them or, um, you know, various things. But it's you know, growing up in the in the eighties uh, on the playground was was very difficult. Mm uh to to your your question of overcoming or, or addressing things um i didn't do really a lot myself um i was blessed to have my twin uh by my side uh that guided me that yeah. supported me that was you know there to um push the bullies away you know, and stand up for me. Um, and a lot of people don't have that. Um, and I wish they did. And um, yeah, and, and, but to that point, um, if you see that happening, you can be that person. Right? You can stand up and support the, you know, your, your friends and 
other individuals that, that might be be being bullied um, because you know we're we all have disabilities right yeah. um, i love yeah, that so michael it's, <laughs> it's um it's just you know i learned to cope with it yeah and um to work with it and uh, my brother was a big was a big uh help with it uh to to that point uh like i said he he deterred a lot of that way and also the friendships that i made were were attributed to my brother as well um because we we were very close together and, and tight knit and you know a lot of his friends uh became my friends um and you know once um once he opened that door a little bit and people mm -hmm. got to know me and got to know who I was and, and the friend that I could be, they learned to accept me. Right. I, I take back what I said before. Actually, we still do go through bullying, the social media bullying, um, you know, so as but adults, it's never going to end. Ridic it's ridiculous. It's, yeah. you know, as much as I love social media and I'm, you know, I'm on it, you know, I'm on the Twitter. <laughs> I'm on the, the, the Facebook and, and all that stuff. Um, sometimes it's just too much. It's just too much. And, and we, you probably remember the days of, as I do, that we, we didn't have it. And yeah. um, in, in some respects, life was so much simpler. Yes. Um, and um, you you didn't have your life exposed as much. Right. And I think there's some comfort in that. Um, and I, I think there are, I, I just would like uh, to, to move forward with inclusion, you know, for all. Yes. Uh, if, if you look at, if you look at various other communities like the L LBGTQ, community and mm -hmm. i look at the strides that they've made and they have i mean from from when we were growing up to where we are today with the lgbtq community oh, oh yes um it's night and day and they have they have yes they still have roads to, to be gained but they've gained a lot of acceptance out there in the community and i think that you know i'd like to give the disability community there as well and uh, show, uh, show the world that, you know, to my point earlier, um, we can, we can be successful. We can do things. We can live normal lives. Um, some things we might need to just try harder to do, right? but that doesn't make us weaker. That makes us stronger, Absolutely. uh, because we have to adapt and we have to, um, we have to try harder. Uh, you, you know, you go back to me, to me getting all my financial licenses. Um, you're growing up in, in school, I was C-level school, I was C-level student. Right. Um, but it, it took more for me to study. It took more for me to test and to, to you know, to achieve those levels um than it, it may uh for other individuals so um you gain i think with people with disabilities gain a, a level of perseverance mm -hmm. and a level of uh, work ethic um just through their their day-to-day -day life you're a total living proof of of you know living living your life and having a full-time job and you know a, a family uh so thank you <laughs> Thank you for all that information. Uh, let's get to um, organ donation. It's uh, near and dear to my heart. What happened to you, um, your heart transplant at the age of 13? Do you remember? I remember it all. Um, I, yeah, I think when you go through traumatic uh, things in your life, you, those memories are always with you. Uh, and I was 13 years old. Mm -hmm. uh, in the middle of my eighth grade year of middle school. And I just, I became ill. And, uh, you know, we thought I had the flu and mom was 
my mom was doing all the right things that a mother would do and uh, trying to nurse me back to health. And, and you know, I, I, I still have this, this philosophy today is, you know, if you're, if you're sick and it's, it's viral, there's nothing a doctor can do for you. So you know, why am I going to go, you know, waste my copay in the, in the hospital? So, so we kind of rode the illness out for, mm -hmm. for a little while at home. And um, I just wasn't getting uh, getting better. Uh, so what were we, your we, symptoms, Michael? I'm sorry. What were your symptoms? I mean, it was complete flu-like symptoms. Oh, okay. Um, it was, you know, not being able to keep food down. It was uh, uh, very weak, um, exhaustion, dehydration after a while. <laughs> um, just, I, I thought I had the flu. Um, and then when we went and we got the x-rays um, at the hospital, we realized that uh, my heart was actually enlarged. Um, and then uh, finally a cardiologist, you know, came in and uh, did tests on me and come to find out that uh, my, my heart was failing and um, I needed a heart transplant. Uh, wow. And at that time, you know, I was told that I had three to four weeks to live. What did you, do you remember your, I'm sure you remember the feeling. What did you feel when you first heard that? Um, well, I think when you're 13 years old, you really don't know what that means. Right. Um, so I didn't even know what a heart transplant was. I thought that they just had, maybe had a heart in the back room in like a pickle jar. <laughs> they could, you know, take it off the shelf and put it in and we'd be okay. Right. Um, so I was more um, concentrated, more excited about missing school and maybe how much ice cream I could eat in the hospital wow. um, until, you know, moments later when my family who was bedside with me kind of, you know, I, I could tell there was emotion there and um, they spoke up and, and started asking some serious questions. And I think that's why it really sunk in. Um, and, you know, I, I reflected a lot over the, those next three weeks. Um, and there was, you know, here I am, I'm 13 years old, but there's so much more life to, to live. There's college, there's driving a car, there's having a girlfriend, there's, there's everything um, that's in front of you and, and not enough time to do it all. And uh, I, I gained a, a huge perspective on life in a very short time. So it was a, it was a scary, uh, scary moment in my life, um, but one that I'll never take back. The things that we take for granted in this life, you know, it's just, I could imagine your family being so scared, your mama, and, and especially your twin brother and your sister. I mean, I could imagine just what went through their mind. <laughs> um, yeah. But God I bless mean, it, you sitting here. Yeah, thank you. And, and um, yeah, I think that, the, you know, of course, I was fortunate enough with mm. it, you know, after, within those three weeks, I... I went cardiac arrest and I was, you know, uh, able to, to, of course, you know, get, receive the, the organ donation. Um, but there's, there's a lot of perspective there on, on life, like I mentioned, and you, you really gain that appreciation. Um, it's not appreciation for, hey, what am I going to wake up and do for the day? You know, it's not appreciation for the things that I, I had the, the, just the tangible things that I have in, in life. It's appreciation that, you know what, I actually woke up today. Yes, yes. So instead of you know just waking up and having your your bucket list for the day or, or different things, just be happy you woke up. Yes. Um and. I think the other thing is appreciation for the people in your life yeah. and, um, and the love uh, for the people in your life. 
And you're lucky um, if you do have that support and love, you know, yeah. um, ever since like my parents left, I, I feel as if I don't have that, you know? Um, so I, you know, I just feel happy for people who do have that support and love. Uh, yeah. So yeah, as soon as you wake up, as soon as my eyes open up, oh, I could see, thank you. <laughs> thank you for another day. <laughs> exactly. And it's, yeah. you know, we take some of that for granted some days. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. And, and we, we need not to. Uh, do you know who your donor was and um, what happened to the person? I don't. Mm. Um, I, I've heard um, some stories regarding it and a lot of it's, you know, disclosed or um, kept secret by, uh, by HIPAA and various mm. things. Um, you know, I reached out a number of years ago um, to try to coordinate a meeting and, and wasn't successful. Um, okay. And yeah, so I don't, I don't really know, but um, and there's just, just gratitude, you know, and, and how do you, how do you even express the, the gratitude that you would have um, for, for an individual and, and um, you can't, you just can't put into words uh, the, the amount of um, love and, and, you know, life that someone's been able to provide me. Right. Um, I was 13, I'm 42. I mean, let's talk about like friendships, yeah. you know, education, let's talk about my own family um, and, and the years they've had. Um, I have a 16 year old son oh. who has been able to you know, be born because yeah. of someone else. Um, I have causes that I support. I have people that I affect through my, through my, my philanthropy work. Um, it's a ripple down effect. And um, that's just due to one individual saying, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to do better. I'm going to give back. I'm, I'm going to, um, I know it's an old kind of term, but like pay it forward. Oh yeah. Yes. Um, and, and I'm going to, um, just do good. And I think that, that we all kind of, you know, if I can, can kind of have people kind of think about that and, and um, on how their, their, their death can actually, or may actually bring life to other people. Because um, there's so much negative connotation and negative, you know, stigma around organ donation. Um, what is one of them? I mean, one clearly just that, you know, people are afraid that, you know, a surgeon's going to come in and, and like, you know, chop their organs up and, and they're, they're not going to be able to have a funeral or they're not going to be able, they're not going to be respected. And I, I completely understand that. Um, but there's so much respect done in, in the process. Um, you know, I'll tell you what. I respect my donor uh, 100%. Yeah. Um, and so does everyone else that I've touched uh, that my life has been touched by. Um, you know, there's various other myths out there and, and um, all, all to which can, can be talked through and debunked. Um, but uh, it, it's an amazing ability, uh, the technology, uh, to be able to do some of this is, is amazing. Um, but, it, uh, yeah. yeah. They, um, according to uh, Life America, 95% of Americans uh, support organ donation. However, only 54% are registered. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, you know. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a very, it's a very eye-opening statistic, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that, 
I think part of that really circles around uh, the process of the mental process around signing up to be an organ donor. Because when you have to sign up to be an organ donor, you're actually thinking about your death, right? And, 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 and who really wants to do that? You know, who, uh, it's not a happy topic. Um, and really the only time that you're approached is when you go to the, uh, the DMV. Right. Right. And, and um, so, you know, one, one of the things that I want to change is making it more of an approachable topic. Um, maybe putting that type of topic or questioning in er other areas that you do speak of death, whether it be writing your will, whether it be, um, you know, maybe life insurance. Life insurance, or, right. Or, or other areas um, where you, you approach that topic um, to be giving tools and resources to, to become an organ, uh, organ donor. And yeah, uh, one of the easiest ways is just uh, registerme.org and, um, go and sign up to be an organ donor. Thank you so much for that information. I had a uh, gentleman by the name of Eric Thatcher. I told his father that I would mention him and he is uh, on a list waiting for a kidney, a live kidney he needs. Um, in 2015, he had kidney cancer and they took two thirds of his left kidney out. Uh, and then they told him, uh, cause I guess you take, um, one takes a uh, medication, uh, what is that called? Um, Anti-rejection medication? Yep. Uh, so, so that- it's a, a mm -hmm. immunosuppressants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, to suppress your immune system and they can have an adverse effect on your kidneys. That's what happened to him. So yep. poor, you know, he's, he's such a wonderful human being. He's so selfless. He thinks of other people uh, more mm -hmm. before him and uh, he's in total kidney failure right now. To learn more about Eric Thatcher and how you can help, please head over to nkr.org backwards slash x-ray Paul Paul 733. You are in the middle of writing a book. I am. And... Um, I'm kind of towards, uh, towards the end in the final editing, uh, but I'm looking forward to it um, coming out in the, the months ahead. Um, yeah, it's really a story about my life. Uh, it's, it's a memoir and um, goes through the, the um, twists and turns of, of you know, my childhood and my adult life. Um, and um, I, you know, I really, I, I wrote it to be, um, to share the story. Uh, it's been on, on a bucket list of mine for a number of years, but uh, I share it as a sense of motivation for other people. Um, they, you know, even though I'm an individual that's been through a lot yes. in my life and for, for, you know, some people call it a miracle, some people call it inspirational. So some people call it just, you know, uh, uh, good luck. Um, I just call it life. And, you know, there's a lot of people in the world that give up on, on certain things uh, in their life, and they think that life is too hard some days. And uh, I disagree, because mm. life throws you challenges, and life throws you obstacles. And those are thrown to you for a reason. And there's a lesson in those. And you need to learn the lesson, get through the lesson. Uh, because once you do, it, that lesson will redirect you onto your purposeful path to enlightenment. So, um, yeah, no one said the world's easy. Yeah. Um, but you have to uh, own your life and, and walk through it as gracefully as you can. Is this what you teach your son? <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I tried to. 
you know, it's um, <clears throat> it's about the the gift I was given. It was about um, giving back to others. Uh, I try to instill that value in him, um, but also to to walk along his path uh, with purpose and find that purpose. So. I think you're the best. I'm sorry. <laughs> it's been an emotional year. <laughs> um, it, it's been uh, a crazy year. It's been a crazy year. Um, and, um, you know, we're the same age. Uh, roughly, I've got a couple more years on you. <laughs> I'm the baby. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, I, I think that it's a year to learn. Yeah. Yes. It's a year to embrace those things that we're talking about that, that you appreciate, uh, the people. Uh, it's a year to learn about relationships. Um, and, yeah, I think about my kids growing up in this pandemic. I mean, can you believe it? Like, we, we are living a pandemic. How does and, that make you uh, feel as a parent? I mean, where they have to wear these masks and... Yeah, it terrifies me. Um, yeah. But I also look at the brighter side. I was telling um, one of my, my kids the other night, like, you know, I feel fortunate that you are living through this pandemic now. Mm. And she, she said, why? Like, this sucks, right? I can't see my friends. I can't do this. I can't yeah. do that. Well, yeah. yeah, but you know what? You have a cell phone. You have FaceTime, you have the internet, That's right. you have cable, you have a warm house over your head and food to eat, you know? So I know life sucks and I know that it's interrupting your informative years and I feel for that mm. right? because my kids are, you know, middle school to high school and it's, it's informative years, right. you know, and, and we're in elementary as well and, and it's it's very hard for them but on the brighter side could you imagine back when we were growing up going through this no we would be playing nintendo the whole time <laughs> and coleco if we, vision if, if we had nintendo yeah i mean my old v or old vhs uh, movie tapes would be probably broken by now it's true it's true um and looking for ways to entertain ourselves um so even though it's gloomy out and you know this this is a very difficult uh time for us all yeah um you know i'm optimistic uh with the recent news um and um i see the light you know just gotta hold in there what's up I see the light with you, and I, I'm so honored to know you now. Um, Michael's going to be in Preferred Health Magazine uh, this winter's edition. We're going to do a nice profile on him. And uh, just thank you so much for everything. You're, you're amazing. Thank you, Melissa. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the time. Thank you. My brother taught me one of the most valuable lessons I'll ever learn in my whole life when we were about 10 years old. We're on our basketball court outside of our house in Cedar Rapids. And we play a friendly game of horse, right? We all know what the game of horse is. Well, guess who was losing? I was. Didn't happen often, right? But I was still losing. I was down to the last letter. Chris grabbed that ball. He dribbled it between his legs. He thought he was Michael Jordan or something. I don't know what he was thinking. But he, went, he went underneath the basket. He took the ball in his right hand, looked up at the basket, said right-handed backboard shot. Threw that ball up, hit the backboard, and it went in. He threw the ball to me, said, your turn. Now we're down the last letter. This is it. Game over. I grabbed that ball. 
my underneath basket, and I'm praying my left hand. Praying my left hand, I looked up at the hoop, threw that ball up, hit the backboard, went in, swoosh. Threw the ball to him, I said, game on. He looked at me kind of puzzled. He says, I wasn't shot. So what do you mean? You know, one-handed backboard shot. I made it. I said, no. He said, I call it a right-handed backboard shot. You have to use your right hand. Now, as I mentioned, cerebral palsy is a motor disability. And it affects the right side of my body. So I have very limited mobility on my right side. I went and I sat down on the railroad ties next to our basketball hoop that day. And I sulked. I told him, I said, it's not fair. You know I can't make that shot. You know I've tried and you've seen me try it. I can't make that shot. And he said to me, those words that I'll remember for the rest of my life. He said, Michael, he said, what are you going to do? He said, are you just going to, you're just going to sit there and do nothing? Just blame this for the rest of your life? He says, I can't make that shot for you. Mom certainly isn't going to come out here and make that shot for you. You're the only one that can put that ball in the hoop. You're the only one that can... That's www.beveg.com to apply now. Making a Difference is sponsored by Preferred Health Magazine. Please visit www.preferredhealthmagazine.com today and subscribe. Thank you for tuning in to Making a Difference. I'm your host, Melissa Billy Clark. If you'd like to learn more about our show, please visit our website at melissabillyclarkshow.com. If you'd like to sponsor or be a guest, email melissa at melissaclarkshow.com.